Hey guys, welcome to The Chris Stefanik Show. The famous atheist George Wald said, 400 years ago there was a collection of molecules named Shakespeare, which produced Hamlet. Ew! What an utterly dark worldview. But it's the worldview you have to grapple with if you don't believe that human beings have a soul. This is why most people have rejected that idea, as kind of inherently gross, and grabbed onto faith. Because everybody wants the stuff of faith to be true. Because if it's not, then all your greatest, most noble, beautiful experiences of yourself experiencing reality are just a lie because you're no more than a bag of bones or a meat suit. No one is happy thinking of themselves or other human beings that way. Thankfully, we don't only have vague hope, but a growing amount of evidence that shows us that the stuff of faith is really true. And I'm going to interview renowned physicist and Catholic priest, Father Robert Spitzer, to talk about proofs for a soul. This is an episode, friends, that you have to share and like and subscribe while you're at it with everybody you know because some things are way too good to keep to yourself. And by the way, if you want to dive into more good stuff, go to reallifecatholic.com, sign up for our coaching programs, and you get access to all sorts of stuff to help you live life to the full. Link is also in the show notes, and you also get the joy of knowing that you're part of funding all the stuff that we're pushing out to the world and to your friends for free. So, God bless you guys. Enjoy this interview with Father Robert Spitzer. Father Spitzer, it is an honor uh, and a blessing to have you. The Your honor is always mind mine, here. Chris. Thank you for come, uh, leading me back here. Yeah. So. And I tell you, it's not only a blessing to have your brilliant mind here, but your joy. You, you <laughs> manage to stay a very joyful human being, and I just love being around that. Thank you. Uh, before we dive into the scientific evidence for the soul, what the heck is a soul? <laughs> well, um, is that just it, like a word from religion? Like, what, what, yeah. is, what is this? It uh, it has three basic uh, configurations, definitions throughout history. Uh, one of them is immaterial, so that generally means transphysical, that supernatural in the sense of it's not controlled by physical laws, physical structures, physical processes. It can transcend them. So a soul we would normally say is immaterial or transphysical. It's got these properties. It could go through walls. It could, you know, defy gravity. Um, as of course, the soul in the various um, at, at cases that we're going to be discussing can do. Uh, secondly, um, the soul has o- always meant to the point of communication between um, human beings uh, and God. So it's a nexus point. Um, there's uh, like this intermediary uh, dimension um, that's part of us that connects with God. So if you look at the mystics, uh, especially the Jewish and Christian mystics, um, they've always looked at it as the point at which God is reaching you know, into us. The body is always the, um, you know, the dimension uh, through which we interrelate with the world, the natural order. So um, it's, a, it's a meeting point. Mm. Uh, for God, um, uh, and um, and so forth. And the third is that the soul is the producer of what we call transphysical activities. And over the years, there have been about five of them that have been elucidated. Of course, from the time of Plato and Aristotle, all the so way. So this through. is before Christians. People before about Christians, things the soul people mm-hmm. have intuited that there's an immaterial part of us, and actually thought about what this immaterial part of us does. Does, and one of them is you know Plato's fourth proof, right? Uh, we desire, and which means, of course, we can somehow uh, apprehend a perfect truth, a perfect love, perfect goodness, perfect beauty and perfect being or home. So in other words, uh, we have this capacity um, to, uh, we don't understand perfect goodness or perfect truth uh, or perfect being as God does, but God gives us enough of an awareness of what perfect goodness might be so that we're always trying to seek better, more perfect goodness in our lives. He always gives us a sense of what perfect truth might be like. And from there, we just can ask questions endlessly mm. until we get there. We, you know, it's the, it's the, the, the origin of our curiosity. The same thing with perfect love. Mm. I mean, you know, people who are just non-content, right? They, you know, they, they, they know that, you know, we're incapable of, of loving them perfectly. And so it's the, the whole idea of, all of these things, these transcendental desires and these transcendental forms of awareness, they're, they're wonderful in the sense that they give us 
um, you know, the, these capacities to move beyond the material world, to literally move into the domain of the d- divine, because really it is God's presence mm. that's, uh, you, know, you know, intuitively, um, you know, it's, uh, present to us, which we grasp, and it, it's, it acts like a horizon. It beckons us to go further. It beckons us never to stay at the same level of questioning, at the same lo- level of authentic love, mm. at the same level of goodness or justice. We're always seeking to, quote unquote, progress in these transcendental mm. desires. But it's, it's this, you know, horizon, a lot of, you know, Michael Polanyi would call it a tacit horizon. Um, you know, that, uh, that he is uh, uh, speaking of. The transcendental desires. What the heck is a transcendental desire? What does that mean? Well, um, for Plato, it meant that we have the power to be aware of and to desire five things unconditionally. Like we could just keep going mm. after them again and again and again. And you never get enough. And you never get no enough. No one's like, I'm tapped out. I have enough beauty. Yeah. No, no. I, I want infinite amounts of beauty. Uh, you do. And you want more, 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 more perfect. And that, uh, can't, be reduced to, that can't be reduced to a, a mere physical need. That I'm, is correct. Or a physical process or a physical structure. It has to come from something transcendent, something transphysical, something like God himself. God himself is our awareness of uh, what perfect beauty would be like, or perfect love would be like, or perfect goodness would be like, perfect truth would be like. Wow. It's what gives us all this questioning capacity, but it also frustrates us. So, wait, so I'm, yeah. I'm kind of amazed. I, this what Plato actually talked about. Oh yes, how the the longing for the infinite points to some infinite out there to fill the longing. That, that's, that's right. In that, five specific I, areas, I thought that was a, a Christian uh, concept that that. That Christian theologians came up with. I didn't know that predated. That's incredible. Well, well, let's face it. I mean, Augustine baptized Plato. I mean, uh, but way before that, (laughs) Justin Martyr uh, was in the process of baptizing Plato. All of them, uh, you know, were at least in some way acquainted with Plato. Uh, Aristotle was much more um, inaccessible uh, to the early uh, church fathers, but to St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, because you know, the, the Crusaders had brought him up uh, uh, through Averroes and Avicenna and Maimonides uh, from the Middle East. Mm. Uh, Aquinas knew Aristotle. So he had a double uh, portion of metaphysics, uh, you know, entering into his Christian synthesis. And, you know, Aquinas was the one genius who could really do it. I mean, I'm sure Augustine could have done it too, because uh, Augustine was a genius as genius. Uh, he, he just had rhetorical eloquence of you know, you know, a splendid, you know, of uh, a splendor that is really unsurpassed in so many ways. But uh, Aquinas was the systematician. But I gotta <laughs> say, this is one of the the ways that I think atheists hope we're right. Because yeah. what a cruel cosmic joke if we had these longings for the infinite. It would be like having a growling stomach and having no such thing as food. Right, that would be the worst experience ever. That we're all kind of longing for this more, right? Yeah. But is that, uh, you know, before we dive into those those proofs of the soul from near death experience, uh-huh. these scientific uh-huh. proofs, really, uh-huh. um, is is that the strongest argument for the soul outside those proofs? Well, is, is um, that yeah, the, I'd say the there's, there's five basic arguments for a soul outside the the you know near death experiences, terminal lucidity, etc. Um, the first is the five transcendental desires. And um, Augustine, so that longing for the infinite, the longing for the infinite. More. But what Augustine says is, um, you know, hey, you would n- if God didn't create that desire in you. In other words, the only way you could get a desire for perfect goodness or perfect love is if perfect goodness or perfect love was present to you, like as a, as a horizon. Right. And, mm. you, you know, in other words, if God is not present to you, if God didn't give you that longing, you'd never have it. You'd never say, wow. I want another answer to another question. Or you'd never recognize the imperfections of love. How could you recognize continuous imperfections in love without having some awareness of what transcendent love would be like? But how are you going to get a notion of perfect love unless perfect love is somehow present to you, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, in, in, in your interior uh, awareness, right? How beautiful. Yeah. And so Augustine really proves if you really want the infinite, if you really want perfect love, God has to be present to you in order for you to have that desire. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And so it's a really good proof. And, and it's really been uh, a, a proof that has convinced 
a lot of philosophers uh, throughout the ages. It's, it's uh, almost a seeing. It's almost a sensing of this horizon in front of me. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the materialist, right? The, yeah. the, uh, the, the non-believer is going to reduce all that to just neurological uh, functions and yeah. parts of your, yeah. uh, you know, your emotion, uh, your brain, and that's it. Yeah. Um, what would you say to that? I'd say, go ahead. Find me under the microscope. Find me in a microstructure in the brain. Bam! Go ahead. <laughs> Find it for the perfect love for me. Look under the microscope and get love, let alone perfect love. Get goodness, <laughs> let alone perfect good. You know, as Plato says, uh, you know, he's making fun of the sophists and the materialists. Yeah. And he says, you know, uh, really, he says, uh, your problem is if I have to identify everything through my senses, then um, you would have to say that uh, whatever can't be identified is is not meaningful it's it, it's non-existent and of course the atomists would say oh yes that that is so and then he'd say so you know you would say then that it really doesn't matter whether a man is profoundly just or profoundly unjust <laughs> because you can't actually identify this yeah. sensorially so uh, that justice that's, under a microscope that's right yeah, yeah exactly so you you can't uh, see it so it doesn't exist it doesn't matter <laughs> But I, I, Plato, will just uh, make this uh, offering for you. Uh, that That's the most important question to ask mm. when you meet anyone. Is this mm. a just man, a just person, or an unjust person? So the it's, most important stuff can't be verified under my, using the scientific that's method. That's right. The, the transcendentals themselves yeah. elude the atomist. <laughs> and of course, Plato is a, you know, he pokes fun at them in the dialogues, you know, endlessly. And it is, the, the jokes are great. I, yeah. I don't, don't want to geek out too much here, but this, this, yeah. this does kind of fascinate me. Oh. Um, so the, one of the geek things out. the soul does is you have your intellect, your will, right? Um, and yet you have your brain, which is a, yeah. a physical, material, squishy thing between my ears. Yeah. How does the intellect interact with the brain? Like, what is the soul doing when it comes to something like knowing, which is in, yeah. which is a uh, immaterial? Yeah. Or how does the the soul interact with with emotion when it comes to willing? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, the soul actually is the source. You can't the source of self consciousness. That's where I'm aware of my awareness. Right. Mm. So it's not that I'm just simply aware of a book or aware of the table. Right. I'm aware of being aware of the table. And not only that, I can actually be aware of being aware of my self awareness. Yeah. Now, you, if you look at that and you go, wow, that's a triple, you know, how do you, how do you do that? And well, we have to double back on ourselves and get ourselves. But imagine this in a materialistic mode. It's not that the dog is chasing its tail. The dog is swallowing itself, swallowing <laughs> itself. Can you do that in a material world of physical processes? No, <laughs> you cannot do that. Wow. So, I mean, and so the first thing, that was St. Augustine's um, argument, you know, for self-consciousness. But Arist it's there in Aristotle, too. It's there in Plato, too. Self-consciousness is one of the biggest mysteries. And mm. to this day, even Sir John Eccles, right, the great Nobel Prize winning physiologist who also had a PhD in philosophy, he was no dummy, but uh, yeah. what Eccles uh, basically said was, um, uh, you know, I can't find any um, principle of identity like self-consciousness, you know, where I grasp my me-ness. Wow. I grasp my me, my interior world, my inner universe. I'm grasping this thing. And of course, uh, uh, you're not going to be able to do that in physical processes. You'll never be able to simultaneously get back to What's what you're aware of, such that you're being aware and the object of your awareness are one and the same. Now, this is this is not something that you have to have a PhD in in in. Uh, I'm sorry, a PhD in physics to to conceptualize. No, no, no. I mean, this is something that people have intuited throughout history. Yes, I and mean, this exactly. is why a farmer is okay with yeah. taking sheep and putting it in a hot truck and driving. Yeah, because there's actual suffering in those sheep. Yeah. But those sheep aren't self-aware that they're suffering. That's There's correct. Just, it's just a thing that's happening. Yeah. So the, Whereas the, children in that truck would be self-aware, and that, that's a level of suffering that would become torture. Yeah, exactly. So the, the sheep is not going to go, wow, I'm really depressed because this is really hot, and I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. Because all those eyes I just used, the sheep can't do any eyes. There's mm. no ego. There's no grasping of the self. 
no grasping of the inner world relative to the complete outer world outside the, the, the self. So that, that has been recognized. Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas, really excellent arguments. And they still go, you know, to many, you know, uh, Bernard Lonergan has excellent uh, argument, you know, contemporary philosopher, um, uh, Sir John Eccles, contemporary scientist and philosopher, uh, Michael uh, Pon, uh, Polanyi, uh, the, the great philosopher and, and chemist, you know, all these guys, you know, really, uh, the contemporary world is filled with people who've recognized uh, self-awareness is one of the biggest problems. And by the way, I, I should point out that um, uh, the idea of self-consciousness, you, you can um, pretty much identify the idea of a person anticipating a future life. We call it, mm. uh, you know, auto-noetic, uh, you know, uh, consciousness. In other words, um, that little grasp of myself, I can move it around in my memory plane. Wow. So, and I can also move it forward protensively oh, into that's the cool future. To think of. Yeah, so that's what creates. So this is something that, this is an activity we sense happening that's not merely physical and brain, but is a spiritual intellect. Yeah, that's and not even the it. highest level ch chimpanzees do it uh, at all. They don't have an autonoetic consciousness. They just simply don't anticipate a world in which something could or could not happen. They don't have what we call creative future imagination. They don't even have uh, a sense of story. They don't have a constant narrative. Think about it for a second. What's unifying all the little bits of sensory information over the course of time <laughs> in your brain? It's your self-consciousness. Yeah. The fact that your self-consciousness is blended in every sensorial perception that you have it's not just the table it's me seeing the table and that <laughs> me is part of everything and what's it doing it's unifying my entire uh you know narrative my my entire history of myself and that so the, the i is really important not just for doing moral activities obviously mm. not just for human freedom which we can talk about later which is really important but even to be able to have a story even to be able to have a constant sense of narrative you say well dogs dream dogs dream randomly <laughs> You know, they dream about a narrative of them burying a bone. They don't have a continuous sense of them. Of life you know, story. Of life My story. My purpose and how many yeah. bones I'll get to bury. Yes. <laughs> what all that means. It could lead us into trouble too, right? That's right. But, That's... but I, I got to say, even the most hardened atheists would want us to be right. Cause oh, uh, yeah. Uh, right? Because otherwise, they're uh -huh. just saying... I mean, they might say, look, this is a God of the gaps thing. Yeah. You, we just haven't yet discovered the part of the brain that if, if uh, you know, we could locate yeah. it, we'd see this self-awareness and yeah. this higher thinking and this love and this justice. Um, but they're really just doing a, a science of the gaps. They're filling in yeah. with this blind faith that we but, will but find. It's far more than a science of the gaps. I mean, yeah. it's a really good question. But, you know, it's far more than that because you can actually prove that these things can't be done by physical processes. Even, you know, people like David Chalmers, right? Yeah. A, a pure analytic philosopher. Chalmers just says, you know, I hate to tell you this, but your consciousness, we can actually show that when you have self-consciousness, self-awareness, um, it, it cannot be done by physical processes. Now, mm -hmm. here's a person who you know didn't grow up in a Catholic tradition like our own. He's an analytical philosopher. But the, the proofs are obvious. The proof, for example, that you can't have self-consciousness produced by physical processes is that it violates two of the laws of physics in order to double back and get yourself simultaneously. How? So, Because, first of all, it violates what we call the location hypothesis. But secondly, the speed of light is the highest velocity you're going to be able to obtain. Well, let me tell you, just to grab Ask yourself, you're going to have your consciousness is going to have to travel at an infinite velocity to get itself at the very moment that it's you know the thinker and the object of the thought <laughs> simultaneously. There's only one word. Simul it's got to be simultaneous. That's in infinite velocity. <laughs> infinite velocity is not doable in our physical universe. So you can actually prove this. And, and of course, a lot of people, like Sir uh, John Eccles, they are perfectly aware of this. They go, you know, I mean, what are we doing here? Why are we trying to, to, to mm. perform alchemy? You're trying to get a, an obvious transphysical process out of a bunch of physical processes. Physical <laughs> process one plus physical process two plus physical process onto infinity is still a physical process, a really complex complex physical process, but it's not a trans-physical process because all those physical processes can't get outside the laws and structures of physics. They are literally locked in the jail of the material world. Mm. And of course, 
our self-consciousness is out there all the time. God enabled us. That's why we're free, right? God enabled us to get ourselves, getting ourselves. That's the first moment of freedom. Mm. And then the second thing, of course, is he gives us rational self-consciousness. And rational self-consciousness. Do you ever wonder why a chimpanzee like Nim Chimsky, right? They, you know, yeah. can learn 150 words in American Sign Language. But it's still just a chimpanzee. It's still just... And the problem is he can only do perceptual ideas. He can correlate this sign or whatever for a banana yeah. with a real actual perception perception of a banana. So wow. we call those perceptual ideas where you link a symbol to a, a perception. He can learn 150 perceptual ideas uh, in, in American Sign Language, but he doesn't have one conceptual idea. Wow. He can't do make a predicate. He can't make a group of things. Wow. Uh, Nim can't make a direct object, an indirect object, because all of those things are like, there's no perception corresponding wow. to them. They're relations, but not a singular perception. That's why Nim can't even pass the simplest syntax test. He cannot distinguish between dog bites man and man bites dog. Wow. No well, offense, Nim, yeah. but you're just not a person. <laughs> you're just uh, I, not I, a person. I, I, I wish you could see me because my, I'm beaming with a smile. <laughs> I, I just delight in, in your giftedness. It's like there's, there's certain points where you're talking. I'm just sitting here watching a fireworks show. It's just... <laughs> It's just, I love brilliant minds. Oh. And, yeah, um, yeah. Wow. Praise the Lord for that gift, man. Oh, uh, but, but I think the atheists would want you to be right, too, because everybody wants love to be something more than a neurological process. Oh, yeah. Everyone wants their goodness, experience yeah. of goodness and, mm -hmm. and truth to point to something more in themselves than a bag of bones, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, some of the most amazing evidence for the soul you've you've taken a deep dive into this oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um now people of faith we should take god at his word and okay sure. he said it so there's a soul but i'm so grateful that the lord gives us a little help right because yeah. it makes faith even easier that's right so i, I just love these near-death experiences because yeah. it, it points to we all hope that there's something more okay well there's there's the hope that comes from faith and from the lord then there's also a lot of data yeah. to point to now people have always talked about near-death experiences right Right. I mean, this goes back to, to ancient Egypt. We could, oh, right? absolutely. We, Egyptian Book of the Dead, yeah. Exactly. And the Tibetan Book of the Dead, yes. There's plenty of books of the dead. And, What's uh, changed about all this? Well, now it's been put under the scrutiny of scientific methodology and scientific systemization and, of course, good empirical uh, what we call sociological studies. I, I like to thank lawyers for this, too, because... <laughs> Not only can we bring grandma back more effectively than ever, there's always lawyers wanting to make sure that they document everything that happens when grandma dies and came back so no one gets sued. Right? So it's just, it's all growing, the evidence. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, the, the real good studies that have been done, they're so convincing now uh, that uh, in this book, um, Science at the Doorstep of God, what happens is. Science it, at the Doorstep of God. So yeah. your near death experience stuff is in here. It's in there. Beautiful. And um, uh, it's. Uh, uh, not only there, but uh, the New York Academy of Sciences last year um, in its uh, proceedings um, actually said there's a very credible possibility that your consciousness is going to survive your bodily death. And, of course, would you have even seen this 10 years ago? <laughs> In the New York Academy. I mean, here's people who don't want to believe, but they can't help but say, I just it's see it's the evidence is here. It's of the woodwork. It's too funny. And, of course, you know, the great Samuel Parnia study from 2014, and then the Pim Van Lommel study in 2003. I mean, these are peer-reviewed medical journal published studies, multiple authors, all the scientific and sociological standards in place, double-blind studies, et cetera, et cetera. And you can verify again and again you know, that this actually is occurring. But the most wow. important things that are almost undeniable and inexplicable in terms of physicalist explanations yeah. is, number one, these patients report data that they couldn't possibly have known about 100% wow. accurately when they have flat EEG, fixed and dilated pupils, <laughs> oh, and no gag reflex. So dead as a doornail. De dead as a... And, and having vivid memories. Mm -hmm. And they not only have vivid memories, but, uh, um, you know, I'll just take a, a couple of examples. You know, a woman, you know, just said, you know, when I left my soul, which they call it soul body, when my soul body left my physical body, it went right through the walls of the hospital. And there I was hovering up near the third floor of the hospital. And there I saw a tennis shoe 
on the ledge, which it was so filthy, it had probably been there for 20 years. It had a shoelace stuck under uh, the heel and a worn left toe. So, of course, wow. the, this, this one of the uh, researchers, uh, one of the doctors, she just had to know. Uh, her name was Kim something or another. Anyway, she crawls out onto this ledge and actually wow. sees there's the tennis shoe. Right there, as described by wow. the lady. You know, it's the stuff that happens in another location. That's be- the convincing right? Because stuff. If, if it happened in the room, you could say, well, there's yeah. a part of the brain that was still active that yeah. we just didn't, couldn't measure. Exactly. But a shoelace on a yeah. shoe outside. Give me, some more, give me some more of these things sure. that happen outside. Oh, uh, I know you've studied the, the, the blind as well. Oh, yeah. Well, that's and, the and second that, that big area. Mind. 80% of blind people, uh, most of whom have been blind from birth, Right, they see for the first time when they're clinically dead. Now, uh, for example, let, let's take Bradley Burroughs, right? Man, so Bradley awesome. Burroughs, sixteen year old kid, never seen a thing before in his life. You know, has the the, the heart attack. He's you know, he's, his soul body has left. He goes through the hospital walls and he says, you know, I got outside the hospital and I saw all this white stuff on the ground. And he said, I just knew, I knew that was snow. And he knew the color. He knew the color. He said, you know, he said, well, he's, he knew snow was white. So, yeah, okay. You know, association. But he said, I knew that stuff on the ground. That was snow. And because I've had it crunch under my feet, but I'd never seen it before. Very beautiful. And then he goes on to say, and I saw these grooves in the snow. And I knew right away they have to be train tracks, right? Because kind of rolling along there. Wow, you know, these are grooves from, from train tracks. And so, um, you know, he says, I saw it all the way in the, in the distance. I could see a grove of trees. And then a train came right past the hospital and it had a big sign uh, on the back of the train with an arrow pointing to the right. And the train just went right down that groove pathway and went into the grove of trees. Well, if there's one thing trains have, it's schedules. So you know where that wow. train was every single second. It was on the tracks, and it can be perfectly coordinated with the point at which uh, Bradley had flat EEG and fixed wow. the pupils, et cetera. What's so interesting is that description was 100% correct of what was going on at that hospital at that time when the train passed by. Oh, man. Now, you're going to try and get a physicalist explanation for that? In other words, you're going to say this was a hallucination? You're going to say it was anoxia? You want a stimulation of the occipital parietal lobes? Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. Yeah. blind people yeah. from birth have no visual images in their physical brain to hallucinate. So I don't care what you're stimulating. No blind person is going to have any awareness of it at all. They can't hallucinate it. They don't have any visual image in the wow. physical brain to hallucinate. So, I mean, it's just like, how are you going to explain this one, materialists? They can't. And by the way, there's so many differences, you know, between the physicalist explanations, uh, hallucination yeah. stuff, and versus, you know, a near-death experience. Hallucinations are almost, uh, you know, notoriously inaccurate. Mm. Uh, near-death experiences are almost 100% accurate. Really? 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 Yeah. Yeah, the, the descriptions are... I think the, know, only, the only overlap would be the light at the end of the tunnel, right? You're yeah. losing oxygen, you might see things get yeah, darker right, with a little right, light at the right. end. Mm-hmm. But besides that, uh, yeah. that, that's where, that's, that would be where the, the overlap ends. Yeah, that's really true because really, to, to be honest with you, you know, uh, near-death experiences are very peaceful uh, most of the time, whereas uh, you know, a, a hallucination is very, very mm. unpeaceful, mm. You know, very agitating and, and so forth. But the most important thing is In order to have a physical hallucination, you've got to have electrical activity in your physical brain Mm. in order to do the hallucination. So every one of those physicalist explanations requires that your brain have electrical energy in it. Near-death experiences occur when you have zero electrical energy. Flat EEG means you know, no electrical activity in the cerebral and frontal cortices and visual and auditory lobes, etc. Basically, you are zoned out electrically, which huh. means you can't do anything. And that's a huge difference. So I think the physical yeah. explanations are just wanting. I mean, you know, and that's why I, I think the New York Academy of Sciences basically said, look, 
This is a very credible possibility that your conscience is going to survive your bodily death. Very credible that Catholics might actually be right, or that all <laughs> yeah. believers in history, which is most people <laughs> that we've been right. pretending uh, uh, aren't, aren't around, right? as, uh, as if everybody's uh, just a materialist. Come on. Uh, yeah, people, exactly. People, people have intuited this. People have kind of known it. But yeah. not, not only is this this mound of evidence pointing to the reality of the soul, it's also pointing to the reality of a God who's love. And it's pointing to the reality of, of purgatory. Yes. Can you share a bit of that? Like, what are these people experiencing on the other side? Yeah, that's good. So, of course, uh, there is that point uh, where they're just in this world still when you're looking at the train outside the hospital or the shoe outside the hospital. Okay, but then it goes to a second phase in a large percentage and, and of wait, people. And wait, what percentage of people have NDEs who die and come back? Not everybody does. I uh, know. Doesn't uh, mean you don't have a soul, okay? Yeah. I had this one guy who was so disturbed once. He's like, I, I, I died for six minutes. I came back and there was nothing. I'm like, yeah. no, that's so, that the Lord will give you a memory if he needs to. Yeah. Well, right, but, yeah, that's true. I mean, that's true in adults. About at least 50% of kids okay. have, uh, who undergo clinical death have a near-death experience. Wow. Wow. Um, and so for whatever reason. Now, adults, it's only 18% yeah. have a near-death experience. Yet those near-death experiences are 100% uh, accurate so much of the time oh, wow. in terms of what is perceived. But wow. then they go to a, another domain after they've been you know, maybe outside the hospital or, you know, on top of the roof of the hospital mm -hmm. or in the waiting room next door listening to what all the relatives are saying about him, et cetera, et cetera. But the main... <laughs> Watch what you say yeah. about <laughs> Grandma. Wait for at least three hours. <laughs> so true, so true. But anyway, uh, but anyway so uh, they go to a different domain, and 85% of adults um, have a very uh, positive uh, and beautiful experience. Uh, so you can pretty much say that that's uh, there um, for the, the adults that have it. 15% have a, a, a terrible experience, a dark experience. Mm. Of that, about 50% of the 15%, um, like the suicides, would be in a place that's really empty and lonely and alienating. Mm. Uh, you know, and sadness is the main uh, characteristic there. Whereas in the case of the other 50%, the dark experience is evil. It's horrifying. Wow. It's terrifying. Uh, obviously, uh, people wow. who are, have been very cruel throughout their lives, domineering, et cetera. And that's about 15% of them? Uh, that's 50% of the 15%. Okay. So about 7.5% uh, right in that okay. area. Okay. So the, our, our, our odds are pretty good. <laughs> our, our odds are pretty good. But here's the thing is, what about that other you know, percentage, right? What, you know, let's go back to the 18% of adults who um, undergo clinical death, have a near death experience. Well, wait a minute. What about the other 82% of the, of 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 the adults? Yeah. yeah. The kids, like you said, is much more frequent, but with the adults, not so. So I've always wondered, and I thought, mm. I wonder if they need to do more things, mm. um, you know, that, you know, in other words, they, they, they're just, not in a position to be judged yet. There's mm -hmm. something more for them to prove themselves or something wow. you know, if wow. they don't prove themselves, whatever. But the other thing is to, I think adults have a much greater capacity to repress, you wow. know, fundamentally repress something wow. that is terrifying or, oh, wow. or horrifying. So um, the main thing is... Uh, uh, there, there's there's reasons out there, but most people who remember it's a positive experience. Yeah, eighty five percent of the uh, adults and almost one hundred percent of the kids. Wow, how do they describe it? Uh, oh, they describe it with four uh, you know different characteristics. Number one is uh, they it's a beautiful place. So when they get to the other side, there it's truly beautiful. Number two, all pain comes to an end. So in other words, wow. it's emotional pain, physical pain, whatever, all of it comes to an end. Pain that comes from memories, et cetera. You will it, be better. You Your are, cancer will end. It's it will anything, end anything like the pain associated with it. There's no suffering in wow. that domain. The third thing is many of those people are greeted by relatives, mostly relatives. 
a few percentage of the time by friends, but the vast majority of the time, it's some relative that comes and visits them. What a comfort. Not necessarily a relative that they knew previously. Wow. Right? So it, it could be, you know, like, you know, grandpa that died way before that child was born or a great aunt that died. And she comes and says, you know, I'm your aunt Margaret, your great aunt Margaret. And you never knew wow. me because you were born 20 years after I died. But you tell your, <laughs> awesome. you know, your mom that I know. Uh, uh, what her secret word was for this or something like that. And of course, the kid goes and dutifully reports all these things. And uh, these the mom's things, jaw drops. The mom's jaw oh. drops. I like, you know, that Colton Burpo, I remember in Heaven is for Real, you know, hey, mom, I met my, my sister. And she goes, don't be silly. Your sister was just here in the kitchen. Oh, no, mom, this is a different sister. You don't have a different sister. Oh, yes, I do. And I met her when I was in heaven. And she goes, well, what, what do you, what do you mean? Uh, you know, how would you explain that? She said she died when she was only two months old in your tummy. And you, uh, you didn't know the Incredible. word for miscarriage, but you, um, uh, she died and, 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 uh, uh, you and daddy didn't know, uh, what, um, uh, sex she was. So, you know, whether she was a boy or a girl. So you just, uh, didn't give her a name. And the mother, the minute, which was the exact discussion she had had with the dad, right? So, of course, mm. it's like... I, uh, I, I love how this fits the, the Christian theology, that yeah. we don't lose our, our individuality at death. This is, we are not Buddhists. Yeah. We don't believe we, we let go of the ego and that, 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 that self was all just an illusion. Yeah. No, no, no. We, we reach a perfect fulfillment in, in, in individuality mm, through yeah. love. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Such that we all stand out forever, and, yeah. and we actually have family members who. I mean, that's just a beautiful thought. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah man. absolutely true. And uh, that's just the, the half of it, you know. That the family members come down, and they, you know they have to tell them the bad news. You know, like I know you really like it here, but you got to go back. You've got to do X or Y, and and of course, uh, even the kids go, I don't want to go back. You know, oh yes, you you have to go back. Your mommy and daddy need you. Well, there, and, or there's some sense that. that I don't know how this does, maybe this doesn't have a purgatory, but there's some set the sense that you died, but you're, you got some stuff to work on. Oh, yeah. But oh. you're not condemned. You're not part of that 15%. That's which, right. There's a review of life, yeah. Right, which I, I hope mm -hmm. that those 15% come back and repent and wake up. Yeah. Uh, but there's a, re, that review of life, but it's not a condemning. It's, it's in the presence of love that, uh, yeah. but yet you got you to gotta be ready for the, for the yeah. feast. Before well, you, you know, the, the highest point of the, you know, the trans physical domain, you know, the heavenly domain is meeting the white light. Uh, and that happens in a lot of the cases. Uh, the white light. And this isn't crazy talk. This is well documented uh, stuff. And this it is happens about, uh, about 40% uh, of the time. No, no, people who have had these near death experiences that are positive, how do they feel about death for the rest of their lives? Well, that's a really good point. They actually don't have any death anxiety uh, if they've had the, the good experience. So in other words, you can actually use a modif modified polygraph and you can attach it, uh, you know, to a person, you know, which measures, you know, uh, stimulus and, <laughs> and uh, you know, nervous response, et cetera, et cetera. And, and there's no uh, nervous response to, no, to stimuli so could, about death. That's right. So which you is could extraordinary. Show them skull and crossbones and sharks and daggers and terrible things and uh, mummies and no death anxiety. Oh my gosh. Whereas if you showed that to a, a normal person, even a religiously, uh, you know, a profound normal person, the subconscious response. You can control your conscious death yeah, anxiety yeah. through your belief, but not your subconscious death anxiety. It just wells up and kaboom. Wow. So, you know, uh, but not anybody who's had a near-death experience, you will find no um, a reading whatsoever uh, of death anxiety um, through a modified polygraph. Um, you know, after they, like 30 wow. years after wow. the NDE. Wow, wow. Yeah. Well, hopefully this conversation helps lower people's death anxiety in general and increases <laughs> faith. Yeah. Because uh, you know, again, this is everybody wants to believe in a soul. Everybody wants us to be right. Thanks yeah. for making it a little easier for all of us to lean into this, this faith. Right, uh, uh, and, and if, if you're not a believer, hopefully this helped you a bit, you know, because yeah. this is the, really what a better way to approach life. Absolutely. To think that I'm more than a bag of bones, that that love yeah. is real, the like truth, beauty, goodness, my longing for all these things, that yeah. my experience of of, of, ex of friendship. Yeah, it's God's presence to you that enables you to to do yeah. all that. How could He not love you 
if he's constantly present to you, you know, just literally calling you to seek greater truth, greater goodness, greater justice, and above all, greater love, how could he not be unconditional Amen. love? How could he not love you mm. if he gave you this and continues to give you this? I mean, there is a, a real proof there in the old Augustinian sense that, uh, that uh, he is really, truly the loving God who loves us personally. Father Spencer. Shaking your hand here. Oh. Uh, it was, it's a real gift to oh, have you with so us. Much, thank you so Chris. much. Uh, God no, bless my you. My pleasure. Praise God.